أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن Brothers, sisters, I would like you to do me a favor. If Jesus is God, I would like you to show me one verse only one statement anywhere in your Bible, any version of the Bible where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. And by God, even tonight. Even tonight, if Pastor Stanley can open his Bible, and tell me, said, come on, read John 1.1. 1, 1. So what does it say? Does it say in the words of Jesus, I am God, worship me? No. Tonight, I allow myself to become angry because I experience a dishonest behavior. And I am full of wrath because Mr. D. Dot behaves like a Nazi officer questioning yes yes questioning a poor imprisoned man under torture because you demand from Jesus that he shall present himself according to how you want him to form his vocabulary and Mr. Didat, Jesus is greater than you are. And when he declares that he is God, and the Bible declares that all are under his feet, even a child should understand that if Jesus tells that to me is given all might and power, even a child understands, then you should pray to him. It is Mr. Didat's first trip to Scandinavia. Mr. Didat is a self-taught, self-educated Muslim scholar of the Christian Bible. He will this evening share his experiences with you, inshallah. Before I hand you over to co-chairperson, Sister Maria, I would like to stress to the Muslim brothers and remind them of the commandments of Allah Taala in the Holy Quran, O Fu Bil Uqud, which means honor your commitments. I would like to stress, please, that this is a place of worship. It is a house of God, and we must therefore honor the status. We must control our emotions and sentiments. We must not get carried away. And we must do our utmost and make the contribution necessary to make this event as successful as possible. Thank you. So like last night, I also want to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ to this church in Stockholm. Tonight we will have about the same format as we had last night. That means that we first want Mr. Schoberg to present his message for 50 minutes. Afterwards we welcome Mr. Didat to speak for 60 minutes and following with Mr. Schoberg for another 10 minutes. After that, we will have a session of questions. 
and details about the practical, how we're going to go about that practically, we will inform you about further on. So I guess uh, we are all ready to learn and now we are welcoming Mr. Stanley Schoberg to start. I have accepted this challenge because I have been asked to come and answer the question, is Jesus God? I did not take the initiative and the question is, why do I accept the invitation? Not because I have any conflict with Muslims or people from other nations. I believe I have proved with my life investment up till now that I do love Muslim people all through my years and especially the last year when there was an earthquake in Iran we worked hard from our church to send air cargoes of qualified medicine to the Iranian people when we heard Muslims tell us about starving people in Ethiopia and Eritrea, we sent food, a lot of food, and collected money to help. And we said, we don't care if they call themselves Muslims or Christians, they are our human brothers and sisters. And if they need help, we want to help. The same we did for the Kurds in Iraq and for the refugees in the desert of Jordan. And uh, when there was a big typhoon with 50,000 people killed in Bangladesh, I rushed to Dhaka and down to Chittagong and together with a Muslim priest and a police officer from Chittagong. We worked hand in hand, risking our lives by boat, going out to the islands with clothes, building material, food and medicine, because we love people who are in need. And in this country, I have been working with refugees who have been Muslims, and we have not asked if they wanted to become Christians. We have said, if you are a refugee and need shelter, we have homes, we have money, I have contacts even up with the government, and I will work for you to help you to find a home in this land. This is how, how I have been working, and I have not had even one negative word against Islam until yesterday. <laughs> Mr. Ahmed Didat challenged me and he did it clearly, openly, without hesitating that he had come as a guest to Sweden. He even insulted me with a smile in his face. And I had to give some answers. And some of you became very angry. In one way, some people had, have advised me to not take part in this meeting tonight. Why not? Because last night you wanted to kill me. <laughs> Do you know that the police is now investigating and they are in the laboratory finding out what kind of poison it was? 
and even the floor in the Congress Hall is damaged. I had been burned alive. And then I heard someone say that we'll try another way. And we had a telephone call as a threat on our family if I would come here tonight. And now I ask you, Muslim brothers, what benefit is it if you cause violence in a kind discussion about the God of creation? Did the Jews have any benefit of crucifying Jesus? Was that good? No. Don't we need peace in this world? <clears throat> Should we not cooperate for brotherhood? Should we not pray from churches and mosques that there will be peace in the Middle East? That we bless the peace conference in Madrid? But God will not listen to our prayers for peace if we try to kill each other because we have a disagreement. Now I'm ready to die if you are going to then I will go home to heaven but I would like to stay on because these are exciting days and I have some appointments for the next following days that I need to keep faithful to these were words of introduction and now I pray unto God the Father and I pray that the Holy Spirit will manifest his power to convince and create evidence and I pray that Jesus will be glorified tonight I pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior Amen Jesus, is he equal with God? Well, the first question must be answered. What does the Bible mean when Jesus is proclaimed to be equal with God? And I like to quote from the Bible because honest Muslim people who know their Quran, they respect the holy book. They know that the Injil is the message from God to us. And here it says in St. John, the Gospel of John, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. That was God. But then it says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That was Jesus. In the 8th chapter of John, it says in the 58th verse, like this. Just a minute. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this is very interesting. The Bible claims 
that Jesus is equal with God. Jesus did not become a man so that he came into existence at the time of his birth. Jesus was of eternity before Abraham and he is and will forever exist equal with God. In Philippians it says one of the most precious books within the Bible that has brought so many blessings into our hearts and this is the testimony of the Bible, the holy book of God. In Philippians, the second chapter and the sixth verse. Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in likeness of man. That's the gospel, the Injil. That's what we believe. And listen to this in Colossians, the first chapter and the 15th verse. Here it says about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. This is Jesus as God. And in Hebrew, the first chapter, it says like this. These are very powerful words in the Bible. Tonight, I have decided to not be so emotional as last night. I think I was a little nervous. And uh, my hands were shaking and it was the first time in my life I had such an opportunity. Tonight I feel more calm. And here it says about Jesus that he who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins set down on the right hand of the majesty on high jesus is equal with god that is christian faith and we always say in this church and in other christian churches no one is greater than Jesus. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is identical with God, equal, the creator of all things. And the Bible says that Jesus, he has divine authority. Sometimes I have seen, as I have been reading through the books or the booklets by Ahmed Didat, and he says like this. And listen now, my Muslim friends. Mr. Didat, he says like this. You don't need to read the Bible. You just read my books. Because I help you to understand what is in the Bible don't care to read the Bible because I'll just make some quotations. Don't listen to that. If you are honest and you want to know the truth, go and get you yourself your own Bible. And then you will find... No, don't make any uploads. I need every second. Listen. Jesus claimed himself to be God. And he did it clear 
and easy to understand for everyone that reads the Injil that even Muhammad considered as the Word of God. And here in John 5 and 21, listen. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Fantastic! Jesus, equal with God, has been given the same authority as God has, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. If you don't honor Jesus, you don't even honor God. And I could continue and give you even more scriptures. And you see, this is what Jesus said. And this is what the Bible claims. And sometimes I wonder, if I hear someone say, well, I believe in Jesus, and uh, as a Muslim, I even believe more in Jesus than some Christians do. But you see, if you believe that Jesus was a prophet, and I quote from his prophecies, and you tell me that that is a lie, that is a lie, and you make jokes about what Jesus did and what he said, I don't believe that you believe in Jesus. Because if Jesus was a prophet, then what he said must be believed and trusted. And Jesus said, he has divine authority. He's equal with God. It was through Jesus everything came into being that has been created. And Jesus is God in the sense of having a perspective into the future. You should read what Jesus says about the future when he talks about our time when the Jews are coming back to Israel, when a lot of conflicts are stirred up in the world when there are famines and earthquakes when the sun shall be darkened as it has been over kuwait after the war and after what saddam hussein caused in in kuwait this is exactly what jesus spoke about and all these terrible things will take place just before the return of Jesus, when he will again manifest his glory and he will give peace on this earth. <clears throat> now, I respect Muslim brothers and sisters who say like this, can God have a son? How did he get a son? And we believe that God is one. And you believe in two, maybe three gods. No, we don't. And you see, Jesus is not the Son of God in the way I am the Son of my Father. You must understand, if you are spiritual, that God is above our understanding and comprehension God is greater than we are because the Bible says God is so great that we exist within his existence you see God is much greater than we even can think and Jesus is a part of the wholeness of God. Even Mr. D. Dot taught us that in, the, in Genesis, when it talks about how God created this world, God is being mentioned in plural. And 
That is fully right in the Bible when God talks about that let us make men into our image. He talks about himself in plural. You see, God is not just a single individual that is limited to his throne. And I told this last night, and I must repeat it. If you pray unto God from a mosque in Mecca or from a smaller house outside Stockholm, if you are a lady from Africa and you remember how you prayed when you were afraid of something that threatened you and you were about to run away and escape maybe to Scandinavia, you said, God help me. And that is the miracle of God, that He is not a single individual limited to His throne because He can hear the prayers of a Pakistani and a Saudi Arabian. He can hear the prayers, the prayers of an African and a Scandinavian. At the same moment, He's everywhere. You see, years back, all of us thought that reality was simple to understand. But science have cleared that reality is above our understanding on nearly every thinkable level. Talk about an atom. Many said an atom is the smallest part in creation but microbiology has now discovered within one atom that people through hundreds of years thought that is the real singleness in universe one atom it can it can't even be divided but then they discovered it can be divided but now Science in microbiology, in atom physics, they have recognized that within one little atom there are millions of particles, like a universe, just as big and that that it could be it could be uh, paralleled to whole universe with all the stars that are right there in that little atom of invisibility, but. You see, God's creation is so great. Don't limit God. Don't limit God and think God is what I can understand and nothing about that. You understand? I hope you do. You see, when we talk about Jesus, I know you have a problem. You say like this, that uh, God is so great that it is impossible that God... We have a whole booklet here written by Ahmed Didat and uh, he makes a lot of jokes and uh, he scorns and he mocks and he blasphemes our faith. And he tells us, is God like this? That God could be tired like Jesus? That God could sit and eat and drink like Jesus? Is that God? Well, let me tell you, that is the greatness of God. When God saw people who were refugees, God thought of people similar to the Palestinians, without homes, without shelter, for the heat, and for the cold, God wanted to fully understand humanity and therefore God in his love decided to come down on our level in the deepest love and understanding. That's the meaning of the message of so God loved the world that he sent his only begotten son and the word begotten it means 
He sent his only begotten son, the son who is what he has always been and will be forever. You have asked, what is the meaning of begotten? Well, that's the meaning. It's not something that happened in, 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 in the womb of Mary. No, God gave something of himself in order to come close to humanity. And because of Jesus, if you are tempted, God understands. If you have problems, God can understand. And because of Jesus, he has a greater love. But not only that, because Jesus came in order to represent us. Now that is the message of the Bible. You see, you have sin, you have guilt, and uh, we have already heard Mr. Ahmed Didat pronounce eternal hell upon some people. And all of us are afraid of the wrath of God if we know about our own weakness. And who is so strong that he can make himself qualified for heaven and come up into paradise and say, God, here you have a real good man. Here you have someone who always made his best. I treated my wife in a kind way. I gave to the poor. I fasted regularly. I fasted from the sun break until the sun came down and I didn't eat secretly. I didn't drink secretly. Who can say? Because I have been living in various parts of the world. I know myself and I know people. No one of us is qualified. We need the grace of God. But you see, God is not the only one on the scene. There is a devil. And the devil is described in the Bible as the prosecutor. And the devil has a tremendous power. You can see how much evil the devil is causing in the world. God wants peace, but the devil wants destruction. God wants happiness in your life, but there is conflict and maybe depressing situations caused by the devil. But you see, Jesus, he could represent mankind because he created us. And he could die on the cross and he took all our guilt upon himself and he died. But here's the problem. I know Mr. Didat, he thinks, oh, these Christians, how can they believe that God died what kind of god is that who die well i think as muslims you don't understand what it is to die excuse me now i'm provoking well you see when jesus died do you know what he did when Jesus died, it was like entering the gates of the kingdom of death. Now, when Jesus wanted to save mankind, he wanted to show love. He died because he paid the penalty of death. But the problem was still there. The devil was there as the, the king of, of death. And, and the gates of hell, they were under control of the demons. So Jesus had to die, not just as a suffering, not to be defeated. Jesus died in order to enter the gates of hell and go straight up to the devil. I'm not going to look at you now. <laughs> and conquer the prosecutor and take the power out of the hands of the devil. And open up for eternal life to all those who believe in Jesus Christ. 
and they are saved from hell and rescued for heaven. That's the message about Jesus. And I challenge you, all of you who think you are so good in yourself, you don't need any grace. Well, try to go to heaven by yourself. But if you need grace, accept Jesus. He will do everything for you. And if you have problems in your family, evil in your neighborhood, someone cheating you, creating difficulties for you, and you can't handle the problem, why not try asking Jesus? He is understanding, able. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. Just try to pray. Find out yourself. Because we can have a discussion on an intellectual level and may be such a discussion sometimes make us angry or dry but the Bible says God is so great that you can't even understand him but you can experience him yes now I do have some more to say I know that Mr. Didat he doesn't like the miracles of Jesus and he thinks that Moses was greater than Jesus because Moses he was able to out from a stick in his hand create a snake something frightening but Jesus when he came you have written a whole booklet about it when Jesus came the first miracle he did he changed water into wine and then you say that Jesus made the Christians alcoholics. <laughs> but then you have never been in Israel. Because in Israel, they are experts in creating a very tasty wine that is very pure and very beautiful and very tasty and there is not even one percentage of alcohol in it and we use that in our churches for Holy Communion do you think Jesus wanted to make them as drunkard no no but why do you when you preach about heaven and paradise my dear brothers why do you when you talk about paradise say that when we get to paradise there will be rivers of wine for all the Muslims. Do you know why Jesus manifested his glory, creating wine out of water and giving them a tasty, beautiful experience at that wedding? First of all, Jesus chose to come to a wedding because it was a prophetical event because he comes to create love and happiness among people Jesus did not really like you see Jesus was greater than Moses not as you say that Moses was greater than Jesus because Moses he gave an illustration of the frightening snake and he wanted to tell the king of Egypt don't follow the snake don't do as Adam and Eve as they sinned in the Garden of Eden. That was a miracle of judgment upon the nation of Egypt. Jesus was greater than Moses. Moses spoke about him who should come to, who should be like him. You are telling us in your books that when Moses said, that a prophet will come who is similar to me and you say that is Muhammad it can't be Muhammad because Moses he reminds us about Jesus but Jesus is greater than Moses because Moses he saved the people out of Egypt 
Like Jesus, he gives salvation for the whole world out of bondage. Moses, he was willing to give his life in order to save his people. Jesus gave his life in order to save the world. You see, Muhammad can't be the prophet Moses talked about because Moses loved the Israeli people, but the Quran creates enmity toward the Israeli people. I mean, you may have your political opinion. If you don't like Jews, I can't help it. But yesterday evening I was reading from your own theology that Muslim priests say in an academy of theological research in the Quran that Jews are not human. That is racism for me. Moses loved Israel. Muhammad did not. So, Muhammad was not similar to Moses. I know that when we talk about Jesus being equal with God, then Ahmed Didat refers to a discussion when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And some Jews were very angry about that. But then Jesus said, well, don't quarrel because you are all gods. So, Mr. Didat thinks, as Jesus referred to the Old Testament, Mr. Didat thinks, well, Jesus had an opinion that, well, I am one among very many, and uh, other people, they are also gods. But you see, if you read the scripture, then your whole booklet is falling apart. And there is nothing more to read in it. Because in the Old Testament, if you, if you read the Bible, I don't think you ever read the Bible through. Because here it says, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise! So what is Jesus telling them? Ironically, he says, oh, you don't believe that I am what I am? You think you are gods? And you refer to this song that you are gods? This is typically for human beings to be so proud. But let me tell you, said Jesus, referring to Psalm 82, you are children of the Most High and you are going to die. But God of eternity will never die. He is eternal. I don't think that you can give me even one scripture from the Bible that will put doubt in my heart about Jesus being God. Yesterday evening, I think I lost some of your questions because of time and now I've asked a few of my secretaries to write out every question you raise. No one will say after this service that I did not answer a question that was raised by Mr. Didat. I'm going to face every question and I will be able to answer every question. And I'm going to defend Jesus as the Son of God. And before ending up, I have more time, but I will not take all the time. I, I, will, I will finish where I, somewhere, I touched this before. And let me tell you, honestly, on an intellectual level, we may disagree. And I don't believe that my words can convince you. Maybe even you get angry at me. 
But I hope we can be brothers. If you need any help, contact me. I'll prove that I am your brother. Even if you never will become a Christian, I will love you as my brother. कितने लोग हैं आज शाम को जो पाकिस्तान से आए हैं दिखाए हम तो एक दूसरे को समझते हैं हम अपने आप को प्यार करते हैं वी लव इच अदर यस ना लेट मी जस्ट से लाइक दिस इफ यू हैव ए रियल डिफिकल्टी एंड यू हैव ट्राइड ऑल काइंड ऑफ रिलीजियंस You have tried people around you, and you have done everything possible with your own might and strength, and still the problem is there. Give Jesus just a chance. Why not? It doesn't cost even one thing. You don't need to tell anybody about it. <laughs> you can you can talk to Jesus even without whispering. You just send him a word of thinking, because in the book of Jonah, Jonah prayed just thinking, "Oh God, help me." So just say, Jesus, if you are there, and if you are alive, if you are equal with God, please help me. Give healing to my sick body. Deliver my husband from drugs. Save my teenagers from being destroyed in this terrible nation of Sweden. I know, Sweden has damaged a lot of young people. Jesus can change their lives entirely, and let me assure you, in this church, we have seen at least one thousand young people who came. They were criminals. They were drug addicts. They were alcoholics. They came into this church and they fell down and they said, "Jesus!" And they were saved, and they are out in society working, taking responsibility. Some of them are married, and they are successful people in the society. Next by is a house a few blocks from here, where people believe in Jesus, and we have the highest percentage. Of positive results, helping alcoholics into salvation and deliverance from alcoholism. Jesus never makes anyone an alcoholic, but He saves everyone from alcoholism who wants to be saved. Now I have become a little too excited. I think I must sit down. Thank you. We thank. We thank Pastor Stanley Sheberg for his speech. And we are now pleased to welcome Mr. Ahmed Didat. Auzu billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillahi al-Rahman al-Rahim. مل مسیح ابن مریم الا رسول قد خلت من قبل الرسل و امه صدیقہ کانا یاکلان الطعام انظر کیف نبین لهم الایات ثم انظر ان ما ينفقون صدق الله صدق الله المر العظیم مستر چیرمن چیر لیڈی اینڈ مائی ڈیئر برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز آئی ریڈ ٹو یو اے ورس from chapter 5 of the holy quran verse number 78 this is actually in answer to certain misstatements that pastor stanley made last night you see he made certain charges 
in that frenzy, you know, he was worked up. If you were there last night, you would have noticed. He confesses that, you know, he was trembling. I don't blame him for holding poison in his hand. But in that mood, he said, speaking about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he denied the son sonship of Jesus, that he denied the death and resurrection of Jesus, that he denied the messiahship of Jesus. And uh, I says, no, it is in frenzy he is talking. He is not true to facts because during the course of my speech, I was telling the audience that we Muslims, we believe in Jesus. We believe that Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe that he is the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and that he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. This is the statement I had made, that we believe that he is the Messiah. Not Muhammad. I didn't say Muhammad is the Messiah. I said, Jesus is the Messiah. He says, no, Muhammad denies that. So I would like my brother to retract this statement when he has his 10 minutes, that look, he is sorry, but in the verse that I read to you, the word is stated, Mal Masihu ibn Maryama illa Rasul. Most certainly, Messiah, the son of Mary, is no more than a messenger. Qad khalat min kabli rusul, many were the messengers that passed away before him. Wa ummuhu siddika, and his mother was a virtuous woman. She was a saintly woman, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was a virtuous woman, a saintly woman. Kana ya'kulani ta'am, and they both ate food. We all eat food. Why does God Almighty want to draw attention to the fact that they both, mother and son, they both ate food? Because he's trying to tell you that anyone that eats food can never be your God. He's not worthy of worship. In the Roman Catholic Church, they worship Mary as the mother of God. The Christians generally they say, Jesus is God. They worship Him. God Almighty says that they both eat food. In other words, if you eat food, you have a call of nature. You need the toilet. And if there's no toilet, you look for the rocks or the bush. <laughs> and this is not the quality of God. God doesn't go to toilets. He doesn't look for bush and rocks to excrete. He doesn't do that. Listen. The verse continues. Unzur. Have a look. Kaifa nubayyinu lahumul ayat. You see how clear we are making our signs to you. How clearly, simply we are putting facts to you. Summanzur. He said, have another look. Anna yufikun. How they have drifted away from the truth. Chapter 5, verse 78. Jesus is the Messiah, one of the mightiest messengers of God, but he's not God. Then, in chapter 3, verse 45, God says in the Holy Quran, is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryam. says, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, Inna Allaha yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu. That God Almighty gives you glad tidings, the good news of a word from Him. Ismuhul Masih, His name will be the Messiah, translated Christ. Isa ibn Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary. Wajihan fi dunya wal akhira, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter. Wa min al muqarrabin, and of the company of those nearest to God. Again, that Jesus is the Messiah and is one who is closest to God. In the company of those nearest to God, we say, as the Christian might say, sitting on the right hand of God. But we will explain that not physically, not geographically, because God Almighty is not a, like a man sitting on some glorified chair on a throne and Jesus Christ on his side, on his right hand side, like a flea or a lice, 
No, no, no. In status, when the Easterner says, the man on my right hand, you could be on his left hand. But I say, in position of importance, this is my man, my right hand man. He can be sitting behind me, in front of me, or on the side of me. As such, we say he is in the company of nearest to God. We accept that Jesus is the Messiah and is one closest, nearest to God. This was the Quran I was quoting, and you can check it up in your own Quran at any time, sir. With regards to him claiming to be God, you see, I have been, the, the, the pastor will say, challenging. What I say, I'm appealing to my Christian brothers, learned people. In my meetings all over the world, when I have a chance, I said, brothers, sisters, I would like you to do me a favor. If Jesus is God, I would like you to show me one verse, only one statement anywhere in your Bible, any version of the Bible where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me, and by God, even tonight. Even tonight, if Pastor Stanley can open his Bible and tell me, says, come on, read John 1.1. 1, 1. So what does it say? Does it say in the words of Jesus, I am God, worship me? No. What does it say? That John is saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Ask Christian scholars, where did John get these words from? Decades before John, a Greek philosopher by the name of Philo, in his philosophy he wrote this formula. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which John copied into his Gospel. Gospel of St. John. And I have been asking learned Christians, I said, sir, you are a DD, Doctor of Divinity. You see the word God, the first time that God occurs in that verse, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. I'm asking, what is the Greek word there for God? You are a Christian of the Greek scriptures? You know Greek? You ought to know Greek? The basis of your religion? Your manuscripts were all in Greek? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the 27 books of the New Testament were only available in Greek. In the Greek language, what is the word for God? Can you help me, sir? Elohim. No, sir, that's Hebrew. <laughs> you see, person gets angry now. Because of your clapping, he's going to get angry. He's going to lose his temper. Please, let, take it easy. Please take it easy. Don't clap too much, because you know, in the next 10 minutes, we don't want to have any fireworks here. We want peace, quiet. Uh, the word is theos. Theos in Greek means God, and the word there is hotheos. Hotheos means the God. Now, according to the system of the Western nations, when they have a proper noun, they start with the capital. Proper noun. Common noun, small g. Proper noun, capital G. God, for God. So there, in the translations, you have got God with a capital G. Accepted. That's your system. In Hebrew and in Greek, there is no such thing as capital letters and there's no such thing as small letters. And in Arabic also, no capital letters, no small letters. But in your Western system, you have capital letters and you have small letters. So there, the word the God stands for God Almighty. So we have the capital G-O-D, God. And the word was God. That second word God, in Greek, sir, is tontios. Tontios in Greek means a God. A God should have a small g. According to your system, A God means any God. That's not a proper noun. 
So you must have a small g. So I'm asking, why have you put a capital G again? Come on, explain. You are cheating somebody. First time, capital G, valid, acceptable. Second time, it should be a small g. Why have you put another capital G? You're creating a different meaning, that this is the God Almighty. A God means godly. You see, in the book of Corinthians, you read there, and the devil is the God of this world. He is the God. Hothios, in Greek. But you give him a small g, I want to know why. If it is Hothios, the God, according to your system, sir, your scholars ought to give a capital G to, for God to the devil. But no, 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 no. You see, you are playing fast and loose with these manuscripts. You translate them as you like. Then, in the Old Testament, God Almighty speaks to Moses. He tells him that, Behold, I have made you a God to Pharaoh. That's Elohim. I have made you a God. And I want to know now, why have you given a small g? The devil ought to have a capital G, you give him a small g. Moses ought to have a capital G, you give him a small g. Where did you get the small g's and the capital g's from? It's not in Hebrew, not in Greek. This is what you want to believe and what you want the people to believe. This is not honest translation. So, I say again, in the words of Jesus, these are not the words of Jesus. What does he say? Jesus says, my father is greater than I. I'm quoting him. My father is greater than I. He says again, my father is greater than all. He says again, I can of my own self do nothing. I'm quoting, sir. What you have been quoting was Hebrews and so on and so on. I said, what? Philippians and who else? I said, who is this? Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians. Who is that? Who is it? Jesus? No, it's Paul, 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 Paul. I want to know what my master Jesus says. I love him. I respect him. I revere him. I want to follow him. But I want to know what he said. Give me his words. Not what some, uh, somebody else, what he thinks, or what it ought to have meant, or what it was implied. Mm -hmm. Religion, salvation, of my salvation does not depend upon people's interpretations, yours or mine, or anybody's. I want to know, what did the master say? He said, the word you hear, the words you hear are not mine. But the father that sent me, he had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Even as the father had said unto me, so I speak. So what he spoke was the truth. Jesus, what he said is the truth. Maybe you understand things differently, but I'm prepared to abide by that. I'm prepared to put my neck on the guillotine. Chop it off as you like, but produce the authority of Jesus. That Jesus said, I am God. Jesus said, worship me. But you know what? You watch the 10 minutes, the last 10 minutes, you watch. I said simple English. I'm talking simple, basic English. I want the words of Jesus, where Jesus says, I hope you all understand this English I'm talking, where Jesus says, I am God, where Jesus says, worship me. I hope you will bear this in mind in the next 10 minutes that uh, the, the pastor has, where that he'll be able to quote, show me a verse where Jesus is saying, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. And you'll never find it, because my neck is on the guillotine. Leave out being God. Just forget being God for a moment. Let's hear Jesus, His humility. Matthew chapter 19, sir, verse 16 and 17. And behold, and behold, one came and said unto him, unto Jesus, Good master, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? 
And he said unto him, Jesus says unto him, Why callest thou me good? What are you calling me good for? Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Only God is good. He is all good. He refuses that you should even call him good. How would he ask you to call me God? <laughs> this quality of goodness. This quality of goodness. I might say, good pastor. And in humility, the pastor said, no, I'm not such a good man. I have a lot of shortcomings. You say, Mr. Didat, you are a very good man. I said, no, 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 please, you know, leave that out. You know, I have a lot of shortcomings. We, in humility, we do that. But if Jesus was God, this is hypocrisy. God is good. And if he's God, he must say, well, I accept what you are telling me. But as a man, he has a right to say, you know, what are you calling me good for? You know, the real goodness is in God, and he is all good. So, therefore, we can see in his own words, he is disclaiming any type of divinity that he is God. He is disclaiming that. With regards to what the pastor said about Jesus saying, before Abraham was, I am. And I am is an expression that God used in the Old Testament when people were inquiring from Moses, Moses inquiring from God, he said, look, these people might want to know who sent you. So I says, God, they want to know what's his name, what shall I say? He says, tell them, Eheye Asher Eheye, that's Hebrew. Means I am whatever I am. Look, don't waste time, man. Don't what you worry. You want to know about my titles? I said, look, just take it, man. I'm D that. Are you a DD or are you a um, uh, professor? I said, look, forget all that, man. Just take it. I am whatever I am. Listen to me. If it's worthwhile anything to you, take it. If you think it's not worthwhile, reject it. I am what I am. God says, Eheye, Asher, Eheye. Now, Jesus Christ, he's provoked by the Jews. And he's telling them that, look, you destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And the Jews say, look man, it took 30 years in the making. <laughs> and you are going to build it in three days? And the writer says that they didn't understand that he was talking about the temple of his body. He didn't go to explain. He didn't explain to them. He created the confusion in the minds of the Jews. If he was talking about himself, he should have said so. The people understood, misunderstood that he's talking about the temple of Jerusalem, and he left it at that. Then they say that, look man, you are only so many years old, 30 years old, and you are, you know about Abraham and all that. So he said, look, before Abraham was, I am. If he meant that he himself was before Abraham, we would like to know how he was, because we know and you are telling us, sir, that Jesus Christ was born 1991 years ago. In the stable, to a Jewish girl, 1991 years ago. Before that, he was not here on this earth. Where was he? With the father. In what form? Was he this man? 30 year old young man, who was with the God, and now God reduced him into a sperm and put it into his mother's womb, and she carries him for nine months, and gives birth to him in a stable. Is that your idea of what Jesus was? He was with God, walking and talking, dining, and relaxing with God. And now he reduces him and says, now look you, my son, you go in into Mary's womb, and you stay there for nine months, and be born like any other human child, and make your mother impure for 40 days. Is that, is that the idea? That he was with God? How was he? So I said, look, read the book of Jeremiah, sir. And God Almighty tells Jeremiah, said, I have known you before you were in your mother's womb. Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I have made you a prophet to the world before you were in your mother's womb. I want to know how the man can be a prophet before he came into his mother's womb. He was with God. So I know you, I knew you. Before you were there in your mother's womb, I knew you then. In what form? 
So I said, you see, your understanding of the scriptures is deficient. You are looking at a Jewish book, which the Bible is, full of Eastern metaphors and similes, to which you have no experience, you have no background to that. You are looking at things metaphorically, literally, and we are creating mischief. The arguments between us is because you are looking at a Jewish book, instead of looking at it as a Jew, you are looking at a Jewish book through Greek glasses, as the Greeks saw it. Because the Greeks and the Romans were the pioneers of that message of Jesus Christ to your forefathers, the Scandinavians and the Romans and the French and the British and all. Who they made you to see a Jewish book through Greek glasses as the Greeks saw it. That's why the conflict. But if you look at a Jewish book as a Jew, no problem. So, we understand now that Jesus was with God, and Jeremiah was with God, and now I tell you, Muhammad was with God, and I tell you, Hitler was with God, and every Tom, Dick, and Harry was with God. <laughs> we were all with God, the good and the bad. We were all with God, in what form? No form. Because God is formless, He's a spirit. How can you be informed? No, in the knowledge of God. Hitler was there. Your quizzling in Norway was there. You know, every Tom, Dick and Harry was there. Pastor Stanley was there. Ahmad Didat was there. We are all there. <laughs> the pastor mentioned that we in Islam, we honor the Injil, truly. See, when we are talking about Injil, this is Injil of Jesus, the good news given by Jesus Christ. We accept. Whatever Jesus gave, if we can see, confirm, verify that these are the words of Jesus, that is the Injil. Injil of Jesus. But what we have today is not the Injil of Jesus. We believe in the Injil, the Gospel of Jesus. Not the Injil of Matthew. You read any of the Bible, Arabic Bible, you say Injile Matthew, Injile Marcus, Injile Lucas, Injile Johanna. Have you got an Injil of Isa? We want the Injil of Isa. Have you got it? You haven't got it. Last night I referred, was it? <laughs> Where that you have the red letter Bible, they have a red, the Christians, you have a red letter Bible, in which every word supposed to have been uttered by Jesus are in red. I said, that's only one-tenth of the New Testament. One-tenth. Ninety percent of the New Testament is in black. Not even a word. Some of the books of the New Testament, not even one, one red spot. In those books, out of the twenty-seven books, there's not even a red dot. Anyway, that means it never touched. The word of Jesus never touched it. You bring your red letter Bible and show it to me. I'll show it to you. Uh, the pastor made a statement, Jesus claimed himself to be God. It's all being recorded. He claimed, I said, show it to me, please show it to me. <laughs> you show it to me, Jesus says, I'm God. When he says, worship me, I'm prepared to get baptized tonight. No wasting time. No wasting time. <laughs> then you made an allegation. You showed a book. You were showing a book. Supposed to have been attributed to me. You showed me a book, sir. You were showing the audience. The title of the book was... The God that never was. You said, Mr. Ahmad Didad wrote it. I say, it's a lie. I didn't write that book. I didn't write that book. Every book that I write bears my name. By Ahmad Didad. By Ahmad Didad. Not according to Ahmad Didad, but by Ahmad Didad. Every book that I write. That book hasn't got my name. It is not my book. I didn't write it. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, there are certain things. You see, statements about Jesus. This book, the Bible, as the pastor believes and Christians believe, is the veritable word of God, God's word. Inspired by the spirit, the spirit of God, which is God. Because the Christian leader says he believes in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. You believe that Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. So if the Spirit is the Holy Ghost, it's God. And if God inspires, if this is what God inspired, that this God, in inverted commas, Jesus, if He is God, in inverted commas, God, was ignorant of the time. He was ignorant. If he was God, according to the Holy Spirit, he, one God ought to know the other God. They are co-equal and co-eternal, says the Christians. So they ought to know one another. So this Holy Spirit inspires Mark, chapter 13, verse 32, to write. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven. Neither the Son, referring to himself, but the Father. He is the only one who knows when the last day is, when the end is coming. Day of judgment, day of resurrection, call it what you like. The last day of that day, nobody knows, even the angels, nor do I know. This is the knowledge of God, my father, only he knows. How can he not know? Knowledge. What kind of a God is this? That he has no knowledge of the last day. And this God is testifying, the Holy Spirit of his God is testifying that this other God he doesn't know. How can he be God? Knowledge is part of God. It is his all-knowing. He knows everything. He knows our secret thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. He's aware of everything. Our motives. He knows everything. But this God, with the, in inverted commas, the Holy Spirit is inspiring Mark to say he didn't know anything about the last day. Then this God, Jesus, if he's God, if he is God, in inverted commas, he was tempted in all things, like you and me. We get tempted. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. But he, Jesus, was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. But he was tempted. He had the same weaknesses that we have. How can God have weakness of being tempted by anybody? Then James, chapter 1, verse 13 says, he said, the true God, God Almighty, he cannot be tempted with evil. Same spirit is inspiring James to write, he said, look, God can't be tempted. He says, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Not only he doesn't tempt, he is not tempted, but he also doesn't tempt any man. <laughs> then again we read, that the devil tempted, in inverted commas, inverted commas, God, that's Jesus, as the Christians say, as the pastor says, he's God, that the devil tempted him for 40 days, and immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted of Satan. Satan tempted him for 40 days. He played the fools with him for 40 days. With God? The devil plays fool with God for 40 days? What is he doing with him for 40 days? This is not the quality or attribute of God, that the devil can tempt God. And this God, Jesus, if he is God, in inverted commas, he learned through experience. He had experience, like you and me. They say he is a wise man who learns from experience. But the wiser man is he who learns from the experience of others. You know, when others make a fool of themselves, we must learn something from that, a lesson that we don't make the same mistakes. But Jesus Christ, he didn't have that opportunity according to Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8. He says, learn, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He's learning from his suffering. He made a mistake, he gets burned, he learns, now fire burns. He made another mistake, he gets hurt, he, now he learns. He's learning by experience which he suffered, by the things he suffered. This is not the quality of God. God was ignorant of the season. God with inverted, in inverted commas. Quotation. He was ignorant about the season. And on the morrow, next day, 
When they were come from Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry. Can you imagine a hungry God? <laughs> By God, I'm not making a mockery of Jesus. You see, when you say that these are the qualities of God, I'm trying to draw your attention that God is not hungry. He doesn't get hungry. He doesn't, he feeds you, but he doesn't, he's not fed. He doesn't need the things that we need. Broiled fish and honeycomb are not his diet. He was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came. If happily he might find anything thereon. Hungry man. Happily. Ooh, I see the leaves there. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Why? For the time of figs was not yet. It was not season yet. I don't know what fruits grow here in season here. What season? In summer, I don't know. But let's say you give me a name. Plums. Plums in May. And I come here now, I heard about this kind of your, your Swedish plums, for example. And I come here and say, I want your plums. He says, Mr. D, that this is midwinter. We don't have plums in winter. You should have come May, June, July. You know, summertime we get plums. Well, I can make that mistake. You can make that mistake. Expecting fruits, you come to South Africa, I speak about the beautiful fruits we have there, and you come out of season and say, those leeches, leeches. I says, hmm, leeches you get December time. If you came in June, July, I said, hmm, nobody will take you, make you, hold you to account for that. For not knowing what is in season, what is not in season. But God Almighty, he ought to know what is in season, what is not in season. Or you don't have to be a God. If you have some common knowledge of your country, pastor, you would know what grows in season, what is out of season. If it is out of season, you have no right to expect fruit from a fr fruit tree. No right. Because your father made it, God Almighty. He made that fruit tree and he made a certain law. In certain season it will bear, certain season it won't bear. You expect fruit out of season because you're hungry, you lost your bearings. And now when there are no fruits, you curse the tree that it should wither and die for following God's law, your father's law. What kind of behavior is this? Irrational. Gods don't do that. Even sane people don't do that. I can't believe that my master Jesus could have done destroying a fig tree because it didn't bear fruit out of season. I can't believe. I can't accept. So if you tell me this is the word of God, the word of Jesus, no, no. This is somebody has misunderstood and I can give you an explanation how it happened that it got into the book. That that's besides the subject now. God Almighty, Jesus, if he is God Almighty, he is a powerless God, in inverted commas, powerless. Jesus said, this is, what said, this is what he said, he said, I can of my own self do nothing. You know what's nothing? Nothing is nothing. He can do nothing of himself, his own power, he's got no power to do anything. John chapter 5 verse 30, sir. He does say, all power is given unto me, is given to him. I can give you a general power of attorney to act on my behalf. You can do what I do. You can sell my property if I give you the power of attorney. So he says, all power is given unto me. It's not mine. The power is given to me. It's not, it belongs to God. He can take it from me and give it to somebody else. That's his business, his prerogative. And then, I give you something, if you remember this. You can win a Bible quiz. You can win a Bible quiz. The shortest sentence in the Bible. Shortest sentence, only two words. Remember this, anybody a quiz? It's the shortest sentence in the Bible. If you remember this, you can win a quiz. The heading here is a weeping God, a God who cries. In inverted commas. Can you imagine God crying like a baby? <laughs> but but this is what I'm reading, John chapter 11, verse 35, sir. So I don't know whether he's hearing. John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. That's all. He wept. You know what's the occasion? Lazarus. Lazarus. His friend had died. You see, the greatest miracle of Jesus was not turning water into wine. He made another false charge against me by saying that I said that Moses is greater than Jesus. That's another lie. No. 
I want you to prove that, that I said... I can. You have your 10 minutes, sir. <laughs> remember the words, remember the words that I said that Moses was greater than Jesus. Remember the words. That's, that's, a, that's what you said, sir. So I take exception to that. I said, I never said any such thing. I know it's not in my mind. I never think like that, that I would talk like that. Ha! Huh. So the greatest miracle of Jesus is, we all will have to acknowledge his giving life to the dead. This is the prerogative of God. Only God can give life, he takes life and he gives life. So the Christian says, look, Jesus gave life to the dead. I said, does he say that? Does he say that he gave life to the dead? No. This is your understanding, but I said, he didn't give life to the dead. He didn't. Read this John, I just gave you the reference just now, read the chapter. Lazarus dies, a friend of Jesus, and he goes to the village, and he meets Martha and uh, the other Mary, and uh, they tell him, he says, you know, Master, if you were here, you know, you could have saved my, our, brother from my, our brother from dying. You know, you can heal other people, you can help them, why could you have not have saved my, wife, my brother from dying? So Jesus says that even now, if you have faith, you shall see the glory of God. You shall see the glory of God. He says, where have you laid him? So they lead him to the sepulcher. A tomb above ground, sepulcher, not grave. They lead him to the sepulcher. And on the way, Jesus is groaning. That's what your Bible says, sir. He's groaning in the spirit, he's moaning. What is that? You see, we, when we are crying bitterly, and we utter words which are not audible to the people around us, they think we are moaning, we are groaning. In actual fact, he is pouring out his heart to God. So, oh my Lord, oh my Father, you know, my friend Lazarus, he has died. You know, please give back life to him. He's crying to God, but the people, they can't hear what actually he's saying. So they say he's groaning, he's moaning. He's not groaning and not moaning, he's praying. And when he comes to the tomb, or before reaching the tomb, he stands there and he says, Oh my father, I know that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always. Whatever I do, he said, I by the finger of God cast out devils. I by the spirit of God do these things. Everything is God, God, God working through him. I know that thou hast heard me, my prayer. And I know that thou hearest me always. Every time I ask for anything, you give it to me. But because of the people that stood by, this superstitious, credulous people, because of these people, I'm saying this, I'm putting up an act that these fools might not think that I am God, I'm giving life to the dead. Therefore, I'm making this performance. I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. That's the reason why I'm talking like this. Then he says, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out after three days, perhaps thinking from his grave. He says, Hallelujah. Alhamdulillah. Hallelujah. This is praise be to Allah. That's what it means. Ya Allah, who? We say the Christians are Hallelujah. Same. We say, praise be to God. Where does Jesus say he gave life to Lazarus? He's telling you, and he says, look, I don't want these people to misunderstand, but now we have misunderstood a thousand million Christians in the world. They all have misunderstood. They said, Jesus gave life to the dead. He doesn't say that. It's God working through him. And Peter, the greatest of the disciples, Jesus had appointed him. He says, Peter, he's given the keys of the heavens. Peter, feed my flock, feed my sheep, mean my followers. This Peter, in the book of Acts, he says, he says, ye men of Israel, O Jews, he's talking to the Jews, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him. Who did it? Look, unless Peter is lying, and the Holy Spirit that's inspiring him is lying, which God did by him in the midst of you, which you yourself also know. Who did it? God. The power is there. You put on the switch, the power comes on. You didn't supply that electricity, it's coming from the powerhouse. Similarly, Jesus is talking, he's uttering, he's praying, he's asking and he's getting who's God's. Jesus, if he's God. He's described as a sleepy God. 
God doesn't sleep, the Quran says, neither slumber nor sleep overtaketh him. But this God with inverted commas, if he was God, I'm reading Matthew chapter 8 verse 24, he was asleep, God sleeping, he was asleep, Luke chapter 8 verse 23, he fell asleep, God falling asleep. Mark chapter 4 verse 38, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. God, please, please, please. I read this, a heading is, a thirsty God, in inverted commas, God in inverted commas. If Jesus is God in inverted commas. He saith, he Jesus, he saith, I thirst. You know, I'm thirsty. But God, I am. Thirsty. Jesus is, so God is thirsty. He said, I'm thirsty, I'm drinking. I'm thirsty. <laughs> is this the quality of God? I thirst. A weary God. Inverted commas. God. Jesus, therefore, being wearied, got tired, fatigued, with this journey, sat thus on the well. John chapter 4 verse 6. A sorrowing God, in inverted commas, God. And he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Matthew chapter 26 verse 37. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Matthew chapter 26 verse 38. A groaning God. We had dealt with it already. And now, with regards to the prophecies, you see, one of the points that has been put forth was the prophecies. My watch. One of the points was the prophecies. I says now, when you look at the prophecies, hopefully everybody is waiting for Jesus. Any time, any time now. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the masterful technique they have. You know, they don't build churches, they don't build schools, no hospitals, no orphanages, nothing. They just do the job. Because you know why? They don't buy farms in South Africa. No farms, no buildings, nothing. They hire halls. They call them kingdom halls. Masterful technique. Any minute Jesus is coming. Any minute and you work people up into a frenzy. But this frenzy is going on for 2,000 years. Based on... I'm reading Mark chapter 13, verses 26 and 27. It says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then they will see the Son of Man, means Jesus Christ, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. Assuredly, verse 30, I say to you, this generation, this generation, the generation is talking to, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. What did the people understand? They understood exactly what it says. And they were waiting. Every time they saw a cloud, that anytime Jesus is coming, anytime Jesus is coming, and people have been selling that over these 2,000 years. They get, they work out some figures, and it's right, 1914, Jesus is coming. 1918, Jesus is coming. And people sell the properties and everything, and they find, <laughs> finish, damn squib, he hasn't come. He hasn't come. 2,000 years have gone, because the misunderstanding was given. Any time now, any moment, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Matthew tells us, making it clearer, chapter 10, verse 23, but when they persecute you in this city, persecute you, the followers of Christ, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another, run to another city. For assuredly, most surely, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes back. And they fled. And they were persecuted. The early Christians were persecuted. And they fled. And they fled. And they perished. 2,000 years have gone. False hopes. Anytime. Anytime. And they went. And they believed. 
that before we can run out of Sweden, we go from here to Gothenburg and from Gothenburg to where, to where, where, and Jesus will be there. And people went through all the cities and they died and the bones have rotted in the grave. But he has not come yet. But the emotionalism is there. You can be worked up into a frenzy to sell your properties, divorce your wife and children, and go out into the wilderness. It can be done. This is how that suicide cult in America was this Reverend Jim Jones. He did it. He made his followers, 911 of them, 100%, everybody to commit suicide by drinking lemonade laced with cyanide. He made them all to drink. Can you imagine? This is how emotionalism is worked up. They can make you to lose things just because any minute, any time, but 2,000 years, sir, have gone and the promised return has not occurred yet. Now regarding, you see, it becomes absurd when you think that Jesus is God. As a man, we love him, respect him, respect him, revere him. But when you say he's God, then he must have the qualities of God. What is God? The creator of the heavens and the earth. Did he create? No, you say so. Paul says so. So and so says so. Did Jesus say that? That I created the heavens and the earth? No, he doesn't say that. So now he says, if he is God, whose he was, what, what was his occupation? This God, when he walked with us for 30 years, 33 years, what was his occupation? Jesus was a carpenter by trade. This God was a carpenter by trade. Mark chapter 6 verse 3. Matthew 13, 55 says, and the son of a carpenter. He is a carpenter and the son of a carpenter. This doesn't befit God. The warring God. The God who is going out of warring. The strong arm method of God in inverted commas. Strong arm method. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. And when he had made a scourge, Whip Jesus Christ of small cords. He got them all cords together and made into a whip. He drove them all out of the temple with a whip. And the sheep and the oxen all beat them all out of the temple and poured out the changes, money, and overthrew the tables. And when he marched on to Jerusalem, you see, when he marched with his disciples to Jerusalem, and they're making a big noise, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna to the king of Israel, throwing flowers on the way. And the Jews demonstrate with Jesus, said, look man, subdue your disciples, otherwise things might go out of hand. So Jesus says, if, if we subdue them, if we silence them, even the rocks will cry. In that mood, he's marching on to Jerusalem, and he's telling his disciples, a story, a parable of what is going to happen, or what he expects them to do. He says, for those mine enemies who will not that I should rule over them, my enemies who don't want me to rule, to be the ruler over them, king over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. Kill them! Cut the throats. You are talking about the meek and gentle Jesus. You know, Muhammad said this, and Muhammad said that in Islam, you know, you can give a wife a slight beating. <laughs> what a mountain he made out of that. I said, like Jesus Christ is telling people, chop off their heads, man. You don't want me to rule you? I'm Jesus. Then, best thing, I have your heads chopped off. Slit your throats. And he's racial. God Almighty, can he be racial? The past has been condemning the racism of South Africa, the apartheid regime in my country. You know about it. What they did to us for 300 years. These Christians, good Christians, regular churchgoers. And I'm told by them that the, the greatest of races are the most regular churchgoers. They are the greatest races. They believe that, you know, the sons of Noah, Sam, Ham, and Japheth. They, the white people, they are the sons of Sam, Sam. And we are the children of Ham. And Noah had cursed the, all the black races of the earth, whether Chinese or Indian or Africans. And as such, they had a right to lord it over us, enslave us. For 300 years, they did it. Thanks to the Scandinavians. Thank you, sir, for you know, speaking on our behalf. And there is some change taking place now. But racism. <laughs> if Jesus is God, then this God, in inverted commas, is a tribal Jew. 
I read it to you, Revelation chapter 5 verse 5. It says, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is a tribal Jew. Then Matthew chapter 15 verse 24. He says, this God came only for the Jews. This God only came for the Jews. I'm reading. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You Scandinavians? You Swedes, are you the lost ship of the house of Israel? I don't know. And the British, and the French, and the Germans, are you the lost sheep of the house of Israel? That's what Jesus says, I am not sent, but unto the lost ship of the house of Israel, the Jews. The titles of this God, if he is God. He says, the king of the Jews, Matthew 2, 2. He is the king of the Jews. John 1, 49 and 12, 13. He is the king of Israel. The kingdom of God. And he, and he, Jesus, shall reign over the house of Jacob. Forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. That was the promise made. Luke 133. He was going to rule over the kingdom of Jacob. Over the, over the, over the house of Jacob. Means the Jews. And of his kingdom there will be no end. But instead of him ruling, we know what happened. It was Pontius Pilate sitting on the throne of his father David. And passing judgment on him. Amazing. He was supposed to be the ruler forever. I don't know in, in the Swedish language whether you have the word forever. I know in English ever means forever. It doesn't mean for a day or a minute or a year forever and it hasn't happened yet. Even today, after 2000 years, his enemies are sitting in Jerusalem. As a miracle worker, Jesus says, many will say to me on that day. You see, the Christians are boasting, they, they expel, exorcise devils from people, and they heal the sick and the blind and the lepers. That's what they are claiming. In the name of Jesus. You ask any missionary, he say, in whose name you did? In the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, how did you do it? So we did it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, we want to know what Jesus says about you. Those who are doing all these miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus. He says in Matthew chapter 7 verses 22 and 23. says many, many will say to me on that day. The last day. Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name do many mighty works. These are the preachers. Who are boasting that they heal the blind and the lepers and the quick and the dead. Let's say even spiritually. They are doing this in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the Lord Jesus says, what does he say to you? What will he say? He said, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Get away out of my sight. In Zulu, Sugani give me, Nina Abenza, Ogu, be rubbish. Get out of my sight. Amazing. You have done all these things, sacrificing your life, your family and everything, going to Pakistan and Indonesia and in Africa with all the dust and the flies and the sicknesses around. And you did all this and Jesus is going to tell you, Sir, get away from me. I don't even know you. I want you to explain to them. Miracles, these miracles that the Christian is boasting about miracles, Jesus says, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, Matthew chapter 7 verse 15, Matthew says, the Holy Spirit is supposed to be inspiring Matthew, he says, beware of false prophets, he says, beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves, beware of them, he says, for they shall arise. Mark chapter 10 verse 22 said, For they shall arise many false prophets and false Christs who will show you great signs and wonders if it were possible to deceive the very elect. So this is not the test that you are a good man, that you are a true believer. Not a test. All your miracles are no test because we are told that even false prophets and false Christs can do that and they will do to such an extent, such a degree that even the disciples of Jesus can be misled and deceived. Yes. Yes. 
<laughs> with regard to that poison story last night. You see, thank you. You see, with regard to the poison story, the young man had a just question. He was justified in asking a just question. It was a matter of faith. You have faith? Then I want proof. And Jesus Christ, if it was him, in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16, the ending verses, verse 17, you read it. You read it that what you are supposed to do. But you know in this Bible here, that verse is not here. Pastor, that verse, 9 to, 9 to 20 verses of Mark are not here. I don't know if anybody here, you young man, can you read English? No, you can't. <laughs> Pastor, would you like to help me? I said, look, in this Bible here, produced by the Christians, 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations of Christendom, they have thrown it out as a fabrication. Verses 9 to 20 are thrown out, they are not here, sir, in this Bible. But of course, as I told you last night, that now they have reintroduced it in this one. They look alike, but they took it out here and they put it back. You know why? This is because of certain individuals and church denominations. They, they, they terrified them, like people are trying to terrify us. Somebody has been phoning the pastor. Somebody has sent me a telegram, a Muslim madcap. Maybe some Muslim madcap to him, some Christian madcaps. We have lunatic fringes among all communities. And in South Africa, I get phone calls and I get letters from the Jews, from the Christians, from the Hindus, and even from Muslims threatening my life. What do I do? These are the hazards of our occupation. These are the hazards of your occupation. You can expect that in one of the greatest democracies in the world, America, 75% of the presidents of the United States, 75% have been assassinated or attempts have been made on their life. True or false? 75%. So this is the hazard of your occupation, so my occupation. You should expect these things. That shouldn't terrify you to throw in the towel and say, no more, I won't preach to anybody anymore. No, no, you don't do that, sir. We must share again and again. The next meeting should take place in the globe, in that globe in your Stockholm. You know, we should get 12,000 people there and discuss about the crucifixion of Christ or anything else. Let us share the platform and share our knowledge with the people. So... That verse, that verse, that verse, it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. If you believe in Jesus, these are the signs that will follow. In my name shall they cast out devils. And the pastor said, you got the devil. You are the devil. Telling the young question, the timid young man, you know, he was terrified to articulate his question. And now, with all the power at his command, with the mic system behind him, he said, you are a devil. That poor man is shivering in his pants. You know, and now, you have got the power, God had given it to you. You should cast out the devil. Heal the man. Instead of terrifying him into death, heal the man. You are supposed to, number one, cast out devils, and they shall speak new tongues. The professor does it beautifully in Urdu. I say, what about Zulu? What about Zulu? Can you speak Zulu, sir? Ninga zinji ngoguti, sino abrahama ubaba wetu, uti kongvusela go abrahama awandana gulamate. Talking about tongues. Tongues means speaking different languages. For every one language, for every one language that the pastor can speak, I'll give him three foreign languages. For every one he speaks. <laughs> and that is without the help of any Holy Ghost. No Holy Ghost. I'll do it on my own God-given computer. Right. They shall speak new tongues, they shall take up serpents, snakes, where are you going to look for serpents in Scandinavia? And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. If you have belief, if you have faith. So that young man was trying to test his faith. Instead he loses his temper. He's lost his faith with it. Faith also goes with it. 
So with these words, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity, Pastor, for you creating this opportunity that I can come into this house of God and share my thoughts with you all. Wa akhiru dawan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. The evil spirit of that man who came up with a poison was casted out by prayer as my wife embraced him and told him that God loved him and she prayed for him until he was very calm. I don't, I don't think, and I will be sure that this man will not try to kill me tonight. And that's the evidence. The demon is casted out. Now, this booklet has been published by Islamic Propagation Center in Durban, where you are the president. You don't have your name on it, but the very interesting thing is the main part of your, of your message tonight is what is written in this booklet. And uh, I want to give you the scriptures where Jesus explains his divinity. He says in Matthew, Matthew 19 and 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He gives himself divine quality, being present as God, wherever people pray. And then Jesus says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Could it be more clear than that? And in John 5, I read it before, Jesus says about himself, For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. Jesus is telling us, I am God because I am going to judge mankind. And in Philippians, the second chapter, it says, Every knee should bow unto the name of Jesus, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So Jesus is going to be worshipped. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus says himself, Fear not. I am the first and the last. Before that he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I am he that lives. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus declares divine authority, but during the time when Jesus appeared on earth, there were so many that called themselves Messiah. So he used another way to manifest himself. He did things God does. And he allowed people to give the witness about whom he is, but at the same time, he did say it. He did say it. Now, Ahmed Didat, in one way, um, you always speak with a double tongue. I'm sorry to say that because you opened up and said that you don't make a challenge, you only give an appeal. But today you said that you look at these discussions as a boxing match and uh, you say that you believe in Jesus, that he is Christ, and then you, you, you spend one hour denying this Jesus and making, you are mocking and, and, and blaspheming our Jesus Christ. 
because there is one thing you don't understand. You have raised around 30 different questions. And this is also the tactics of the Muslims in this uh, discussion, because you have come here to challenge my Christian faith. And the Muslims have told me, don't say anything against the Quran. And then you ask me to speak before you, and then you give me 10 minutes to answer 30 questions. It's not fair. But I, I just want to tell you that all what you don't understand is what the Bible says. The great love of God, He, it says like this, that Jesus being equal with God, in the form of God, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Why scorn and mock and blaspheme this Jesus when he came and wept with the people in sorrow? Why make funny Stories about Jesus being hungry when he wanted to identify with the starving people. Never Muslims make anything to help their refugees. The Christians have to do it. Jesus, Jesus was willing to become an ordinary man. And he prayed unto his father during that time. He felt pain. He was sleepy. That is fully right. And when he talked to the fig tree, you have not read the Bible. This is what I always say. Because if you knew the Bible, you knew that Jesus, when he spoke to the fig tree, he knew that in the Old Testament, Israel always was illustrated as a fig tree. And Jesus prophesied against Israel at that time. There are explanations on every attack that you have on Christianity. And when you say that Jesus is a racist, I get upset. Because Jesus, he said, go into all the world and make all kind of people my disciples and he explained how they should start in Jerusalem and then in Judea and then go further on to Samaria and then into the whole world and this was the strategy of Jesus those verses you quote I mean if I'm going to carry away as we did listen here we gave to Eritrea when Eritrea and Ethiopia was starving, we gave one million kilo wheat from my church. And we sent it, listen, we sent it with a boat. But do you make a joke? Do you mock me? Do you blaspheme me if I must say that because of our limitations, we had to take 25 kilo first? And then we took 25 more, and then 100 kilo, and then 1,000 kilo. And if I said, the first hours, we take only 500 kilo, then we will continue with 500 more. Jesus said, now I, I have just come now to the Israelis. I must start here in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. But then he declared, and you always keep quiet about what the Bible says in its, const in its context. This is your tactic all over the world. Jesus said, my love is for the whole world. Amen. Time is out, and this is very typical. Many questions, no time to, ask, to answer. We thank you, Mr. Stanley Sherberg and Jacques Medidat for their speeches.
Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to proceed to the session where it's going to be your turn to ask questions. We have not yet told or informed about how this is going to go about, so I don't think there's any idea that you line up yet. We have to be finishing this session at, no, at 10 o'clock tonight, so we will have about one hour. And my co-chairman here will inform you about the rules of the question, and please listen carefully. Thank you. Once they have settled down. Okay. Yeah, but we haven't informed about how they should stand. We have to inform them now. No, I thought you were talking. No, I didn't. Sisters and brothers, we have now come to the question time. There is a mic in front here. Could you please form a queue facing the mic? The queue can run along, round the corner to the gangway, so that it is an orderly queue. Thank you. Only this side. Yes, only that. Now, in order for the questions to be conducted efficiently and, and fairly, brothers and sisters, would you please pay attention? Sisters and brothers, please pay attention. Thank you. In order for the questions to be conducted fairly and efficiently, there are certain rules that we must follow. First of all, please, will you present your question relating to the topic in hand, that is, is Jesus God? And please do remember that it is question time and not lecturing time. If you wish to deliver a lecture, perhaps you will make some arrangements with Pastor Stanley and he may be able to organize that for you, in which case we shall come and listen to you. And only one question at a time, please. If you wish to make or ask more questions, please go to the end of the queue and wait your turn again. Please also present your question in a brief and concise manner and to the point. Lastly, brothers and sisters, as there are two speakers here, and we have to be fair to both of them, the questions will be treated in an alternative order so that we shall have first question for Pastor Stanley, the next question will then be for Mr. Didad, and so on until we run out of time. Thank you. We also want to inform that the last question will be allowed at 10 to 10. So the first question goes to Mr. Stanley Schoberg. Uh, I'm a Muslim woman Swedish. I have a convert to Islam because I get so confused with the Gleese with the church, excuse me, I speak French, uh, because I always wonder if I'm going to pray to God or if I'm going to pray to Jesus or if I pray to Jesus before God or I, I don't understand this, this is very confusing and I say so when I turn to, when I come to Islam I have this clear clear for me. It's only one God, and I believe it's that it's way. I don't want to... Uh, I believe in Jesus too, but I want to say that uh, he, he was also flesh and blood, like you and me. And we are all, way, all, all human beings. And I hope you understand my question. I do fully understand your question. <laughs> and... The Bible tells us that we should pray unto God. 
And there is no conflict within the Trinity as the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are one, as God is one. And if you pray unto God the Father, or you talk to Jesus, or you ask for guidance of the Holy Spirit, you talk and address the same God. But Jesus came into this world in order to reconcile mankind with God, and therefore we are taught to pray in the name of Jesus, because as Jesus resurrected from death. He resurrected in a heavenly body. You said here before that Jesus could not be God as he could eat, but like the angels and God consumed the sacrifices in the Old Testament, Jesus in his heavenly body. He is divine in spite of his revelation in front of the disciples. So you pray to God in the name of Jesus. That's the way to come in close contact with God. Thank you, Stanley Shogun. The next question will go to Mr. Ahmed Didat. Assalamu alaikum. My question is to Mr. Ahmed Didat. First of all, I'd like to thank him very much for all the help he has given me personally and to many other people like me who, uh, who have uh, embraced Islam and who this used to be my church, 84, 85, this used to be my church. Now, my question is, uh, I would like Mr. Didat to explain a little bit more about um, uh, 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 refute, to refute more of the Trinitarian doctrine and if possible to give us a little bit of a history of the development of that doctrine, the Trinity. We know that it was a result of a long period of theological infighting that the divinity of Jesus Christ's holy nature was established and that this debate actually took place in Alexandria between 316 and 323 BC in Egypt between an African Athanasius and Arius. Athanasius's point is if Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he must be younger than God and since God is eternal, he cannot be God. I'd like Mr. Didat anyway to explain a bit about this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Before I give any understanding of the Trinity, I must thank the Almighty and say, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah for saving my neck. The pastor, he had 10 minutes and the Bible in his hand, he couldn't give what I was asking. I said, one phrase, one sentence in the Bible where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. Thank God, he failed. And I knew that, therefore I took a chance, otherwise I would never have taken such a chance. <laughs> With regards to Trinity, you ask the Trinitarians, ask the Trinitarians. They believe the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. And they continue in their catechism that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But they are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. That's how the catechism goes. And it proceeds, the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they are not three persons, but one person. I'm asking the English-speaking people, because I can't speak Swedish, the English-speaking people, I said, do words, do they have any meaning in your language? Do they have any meaning? Or you just utter words without any meaning? You said person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I said, what language are you speaking? It's because I know English. They taught me, the British have taught me English. <laughs> so what language are you speaking? This is not English, this is gibberish, not even Greek. This is gibberish. Person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I said, if you, who, any one of you, and your two other brothers are identical triplets, identical, we can't make out the difference between the th three of you. If one of you commit murder, can we hang the other? I said, why not? 
you all look alike? So he says, no, you see, I am a different person. I said, what makes you a different person? Your personality. Now, in your mind, the Father is different, the Son is different, and the Holy Ghost is different. When you say in the name of the Father, you have a certain mental picture of the old Father Christmas, bigger than anything that we can imagine, millions and millions of times, bigger than man, but something like a man, with the heaven as his canopy, and the earth as his footstool, the loving Father in heaven. When you say God the Son, what are you thinking of? A prize bull? Or a false father. No. You are thinking of a handsome young man. Like what you saw in the King of Kings. Where Jeffrey Hunter was acting. Blonde hair. Blue eyes. A Nordic type. A Scandinavian type. Not a Jewish type. He doesn't look like a Jew. There's one. In... There's a picture of Jesus Christ. There at the back here. Where they gave me place to rest before coming over here. On the wall. And you see handsome young man, like a Norwegian or a Swede, blue eyes and all, and you see a halo on his head. There, there. If they allow you, go and have a look. There's a halo on his head. I said, where did you get the halo from? You know, that ring, neon light ring, suspended in air. Where did you get it from? Is the Bible says that, that he had a halo around his head? Did the Jews see any such thing? No, no. But you see now, we are all programmed into thinking and believing anything, everything that the man says with force, we accept. So I said, this trinity is thrown out, the verse on the trinity, the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, is taken out, thrown out of this Bible, the Revised Standard Version, as a fabrication. It's not here. It's taken out. Why? Because this was a note made by a certain vigilance of Thapsus in the 6th century for his own edification or for the edification of his children. Which when the publishers, when they came across a manuscript, that marginal note came into the text. It crept in into the text. Now your scholars now discover that this is a fabrication, this is a note. This is not the works of John. So they took it out as a fabrication, as an interpolation. Jesus Christ, he never taught the Trinity. When he was questioned, Gospel of St. Mark, a learned man of the Jew comes and asks him, he says, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, what commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered and said unto him, the first is, Shama Israelu Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad. Say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He repeated word for word what was given by Moses some 1300 years before, without the change of a dot. If Trinity was what he came to teach, that was the right moment to educate the guy, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He never said any such, such thing. He merely reminded him about what Moses had given 1300 years before. So there is no such thing as the Trinity as taught in the Bible by Jesus Christ. Next question goes to Mr. Stanley Shepard. Stanley, I really have uh, great respect for your concern of being maybe killed or being threatened. I do believe you because there's a lot of so-called Muslim losing their temper. I'm sorry for them, you know. The second thing that I would love to, because you pointed yesterday, you point today again, you know, is that you saying, which with all the truth, that you helped a lot of Muslims, that you sent food to Eritrea, to Ethiopia and all things. But the problem that you don't tell, none of those countries, even they call themselves Muslim, have a Muslim government. They are government who are copy of Europe. So, quiet, quiet. Now came to my question. My question is very easy. My question is that the Gospels are telling lies. They are saying that Jesus lies. Such a great man. In John 7, 8 to 10, is telling exactly that Jesus tell them to the tabernacles to go up to the feast. 
with his brother, but don't tell them I'm coming. Which and verse? John 7, from 8 to 10. And he told them, don't tell them that I'm coming, or I'm going up to the feast. And then he went up again with his brother, not publicly, but in private. That's mean. The gospel is clearly saying clearly that Jesus lied. Because he told his brothers, tell them, I'm not coming to the feast. And then he went up on private. The second thing in my question is in the Old Testament a lot. In Genesis 19, 35, 36. Sorry, sir, one, question. one question. Yeah, it's one question. question. It's, it's, uh, in Genesis, he's saying that Lot, his daughters, made up their mind to make love to him and to have kids. Are you in Christianity stimulating incest? Thank you, sir. Please, sir, no. you sit down. Uh, I will be able to answer. Uh, concerning uh, Islamic governments, I did not know that you do not believe that Iran has a government made up of Muslims. I, do not, I did not know that Pakistan is a non-Muslim country. I did not know that. But I have heard that actually Iran and Pakistan they are built up by Muslims. And the same with Iraq. Even if you don't like Saddam Hussein, the, the Kurds, they are Muslims, and we did help the Kurds. We work with Muslims if they are under government of someone else or under uh, real Islamic laws. And concerning Mr. Didat, uh, Tonight, I allow myself to become angry because I experience a dishonest behavior. And I am full of wrath because Mr. Didat behaves like a Nazi officer questioning... Silence, yes. please. Yes, Silence, questioning please. a poor, imprisoned man under torture because you demand from Jesus that he shall present himself according to how you want him to form his vocabulary. And Mr. Didat, Jesus is greater than you are. And when he declares that he is God, and the Bible declares that all are under his feet, even a child should understand that if Jesus tells that to me is given all might and power, even a child understands, then you should pray to him. And then concerning Jesus, as you say you believe in and all the time, you want to miscredit our Jesus. And then you try to lift up someone else whom you called Jesus Christ. Now we who know the Bible, we know we must be careful in these days. Because now you said that we have been waiting for Jesus to come back for 2,000 years. And I'll tell you, the Jesus you talk about and you want to lift up is not our Jesus. The Bible talks about a figure in the end time that will come and proclaim himself as Christ Messiah. But he is the Antichrist and he will have a false prophet at his side. Now, why do you say that Jesus is lying when, he's, when it is written in John 7, quoting what, what Jesus said himself, Now, go ye up unto the feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. So, listen, Jesus said, now you go, because I am not ready yet. I will stay at home and pray, and prepare my inner spirit, because when I arrive in Jerusalem, 
I'll come a few days later than you. You go. I will come a few days later. And then when he came, he blessed the people as God bless people. And don't say that my Jesus is telling lies. He does not. The next question goes to Mr. Didat, and as we see the line here getting longer and longer, we have to suggest, for the sake of all of us here, that we are as precise and short in our questioning as possible, and also that, please, the speakers would respect this time limit and that we would keep as short as possible. Thank you. My question, in very short, in the Old Testament, we was taught that eye by eye, teeth by teeth, revenge, etc., etc. We grew up, Jesus came, he taught us all of these things, if you might know, and I'm quite sure you know. But let me inter you know, interrupt this sisters and, and ask you one question before. You said that you believe in God. This God has character. He knows the future, he knows the past, he knows the presence, he doesn't change his mind. Do you agree? I go on. Jesus came, and I'm quite sure that what I'm saying here, you find in any of these books, and you might find it in Quran too. Jesus came and taught us, if one slapped you on the right cheek, give him the left one. Sympathy, mercy, no violence, love, shalik. He taught us, if one asks you to go a mile with him, go too. If he asks you your coat, give him your dress. When he asked his uh, disciples, Larryinger, to go and preach in the world, he told them, go and preach my word in peace, no violence. If they accept your word, take it. If they don't take it, go and go on. Why after five, no, sorry, 600 years, the God whom you believe, and I do, how he changed his mind again. He tells me, the one who hits you, hit him again. Go and preach in my name. And if they don't accept my name and my word, kill them. If your wife missed, if your wife does it unfaithful to you, kill her. Kill, punish, kill, punish, hate, hate, hate. Thank you, he sir. He raised me up. Question. Why you take me very much down again? Sir, your question is clear. Thank you. Silence, please. Thank you. Well, here's some more hot steam. The brother said, Islam says, the teaching of Jesus was turning the other cheek. If a man takes away your coat, give him your cloak also. Agree with thine adversary quickly, Jesus said, before they take you before the magistrate and make you to pass with your last farthing. But now you said God doesn't change his mind. But he had given you a law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You are a Christian today. From your question, I make out you are a Christian. Right. But now God changed his mind. Didn't he change his mind? First was eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now he's telling him, you resist not evil. When a man hits you on the right cheek, give him the other. He changed his mind. He changed his mind according to your Bible. Wait a minute. And then again, he told you, God told you, that whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. But Jesus said, but I say unto you, whosoever puts away his wife, save for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever marries her that is divorced, committed adultery. He changed his mind again. And he's changing his mind continuously. But you said God doesn't change his mind. Now, you will have to account, or the pastor will have to account for that, not me. When you say, make allegation against the Quran, the Quran says that if anybody does not accept Islam, chop off his head, kill him. Here is the Quran, and you have up to 10 o'clock to find that verse and show it to us. I'll read it for the people. Thank you, Mr. Didat. 
My question is that you said Jesus Christ died for our sins. That happened some 2,000 years ago. Mankind has been in existence for thousands of years. Sins are not decreasing, they are increasing. Look in North America, look in South America, look in Asia, look in Africa. Sins, alcohol, drugs, rape, incest is increasing. Will we get another Jesus to come and die for our sins? Thank you. The answer is this. The answer is this. Please silence. Thanks. When the Bible explains the battle between God and the devil, between good and evil, the Bible explains that God has a plan for salvation and restoration, but this is a difficult struggle even for God because mankind turns its back toward God time after time. Now, what Jesus did when he died at the cross, he gave us all for all generations a possibility to receive forgiveness as we repent. But the real victory over evil and over the devil has not yet been seen. And the Bible says, I don't know, I don't understand why it takes so much time, but the Bible says that evil is a force of respectable character. And this evil powers, they are stronger because so many turn their back toward God. We don't need another Jesus to take our sin and guilt. There is forgiveness in the very moment we repent. And the Bible says that in this time, very soon, Jesus will come in glory, not to die again, but to manifest his power. And then there will be peace. Satan will be bound. Evil spirits will be removed from earth. And God will be sovereign. That's the answer from the Bible. And uh, we pray for that. And I wish we all could work in that direction. Thank you. Next question goes to Mr. Ahmed Dat. Uh, first of all, I have to agree with Pastor Sherby that Silence, these two the last evenings really has made us Christians upset, emotionally upset. Uh, Mr. Ahmed did that. Yesterday evening, you said that my holy book... Silence, please. Thank you. My holy book, the Bible, is the most dangerous book which ever has been written in the world. What are you talking about? What in hell are you talking about? I'm sorry I'm using that word in the church. Your question, please. Thank you. I have been, no, I have to tell this. I have been married to an Egyptian Muslim doctor. And I have two Muslim children. And I have had wonderful Muslim parents in law. But they were completely different from you. Do they have gone to Mecca? Do they follow everything from the Quran? But I respect them because they respected my religion. Sorry, I must come to your question. And please. now Thank you. you talked about the occupation. Yes, my question will be: What was the occupation of the Prophet Muhammad, and how old was his youngest wife when he married her? Yes. One Thank of you. the ten. Thank you. Six That's or ten years old. Thank you. Silence, please. The question goes to Mr. Ahmed Dada. 
Please respect the time limit so we can have as many questions as possibly answered. Thank you. Silence, please. My dear sister, my dear sister, I couldn't grasp everything that you said, but you made certain allegations that I had said that the Bible is the most dangerous book on earth ever written. You don't remember exactly what I said. I will tell you what I said, and you can confirm or deny. I said in the words of George Bernard Shaw, I said, George Bernard Shaw says that this is the most dangerous book on earth. Keep it under lock and key. I said, George Bernard Shaw says that. There's a videotape, videos are being made, you can have it confirmed, and I hope and pray that I come again to Scandinavia, to Stockholm, and if you can find that I said that exact words, these are the words of, and the plain truth, he says, you know, many a censor will give it an X rating. Now, out of respect for my brothers and sisters, my sisters and my children, I am I'm ashamed to quote you the Bible. I asked Jimmy Swaggart. I challenged him. I said, I give you $100 if you will read this portion of the Bible. And I opened Ezekiel chapter 23 and I gave it to him. And that tape is also available here. Videotape. My debate with Swaggart. And you watch. He takes the Bible and he scans Ezekiel 23. And he puts this Bible on the, what do you call that, rostrum, upside down. He takes his own Bible and he reads it. And I lost hundred dollars. I lost hundred dollars. You know why? I lost one hundred dollars to Jimmy Swaggart for reading that. You see, he had played a trick upon the audience and I was not a, a quibbler. I don't start quibbling. So you see, you know, you did, I, no, 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 I don't do that. With a smiling face, I took out the nose and I gave it to him. Jimmy Swaggart, it's on tape. What he did was, you see, what I gave him was in simple English, modern English, where it calls a spade a spade. He scanned that and he knew he can't read that. Even he, with whatever we discover about him later on, even with all those propensities, he dared not read what I gave him, the Bible. He takes the authorized King James Version and he read 60 miles an hour. See, some Arab students in Dayton Rouge, they're asking me the next morning, he said, Uncle, what happened? We don't know. I said, you see, you know, he, you challenged him and you know, he did something and you gave him hundred dollars. Why? So I said, you see, this man, number of things he did, which made him to earn the hundred. Number one, he didn't read what I gave him. Number two, he was reading 60 miles an hour. Son of man, there were two women, daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in the youth. They committed whoredoms in Egypt. <laughs> and there were the breast press, and there the bruised the teeth of the virginity. The ordinary Arab, he can't catch whoredom. What is whoredom? He's thinking, what, what is it? What did he say? And before he can grasp what he could have said, he's gone 10 miles beyond. The speed with which he was reading, the archaic English that he was reading, and Pornography to the American young men is not pornography. They are used to it. Day and night, 24 hours a day, you see it on TV, live. So these are the things I don't know if you want personally, you know, the opportunity of wanting me to read it to you. Ezekiel chapter 16, you read about the Egyptians. The Egyptians, she spoke about an Egyptian husband. Speak about the Egyptians and it says greater flesh. Now what do you understand by that? The Egyptians and the Syrians, great of flesh, they couldn't satisfy, satiate these Jews, these Jewish prostitutes. Ezekiel chapter 16. I can't read it to you, but if the pastor wants to, I can open up Ezekiel chapter 16, and if the pastor dare to read it, it's his privilege. Thank you. We're proceeding next question, and it will be asked to 
Mr. Stanley Schoberg. Yeah, I'm fine. Silence, please, from everyone in the hall. Thank you. Allahu Akbar. Min Ashikhan Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Pastor Stanley, uh, indeed, uh, I'm a bit disappointed because you, a man of your religious stature, to stand here and ridicule us Muslims as immigrants in this country, telling people how much you have helped us and all that. At the same time, I believe you speak in a double tongue. Excuse me, ex excuse the expression, because you used it yourself. Well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not used to speaking in public, so my, my heart is pounding. <laughs> uh, but you see, you keep pounding into the hearts of the people that we Muslims, we hate Jews. You make an equal sign between us and, and uh, how to say, Nazis. And you forget that we are living in this country where right now racial racism is, is, is rising very much. Now I want to ask you one, one simple question. Did, your, did Jesus, your God, tell you to treat people that way? Thank you. I want to give you an answer. If you invite me to a meeting in which you want to challenge my faith, and when I come, and I also have to pay some money in order to come, I share some of your expenses, and then I come to you, and your contribution to me is to give me poison to kill me. Then I must tell you that I have a better Christian character. When I meet Muslims, I give them bread to eat. We plant trees. Silence, we, please. We dig wells. Silence, we, please. We, we give them water to drink. And that is quite another character. Silence, please. Thank you. And why I use these words were because my Jesus is insulted and even if I give answer upon answer upon answer and I've seen videotapes, I know books and Christian leaders, they have given their answer to Mr. Didat and he continues to raise the same questions and he puts his fingers in the ears and he doesn't want to hear any answer. Then I remind myself from such situations I've heard from when people are tortured, imprisoned, and the captain continues to ask questions, and he doesn't want any answer. He just wants to kill. <laughs> and I just want to say, you must have a very, very dirty imagination. If you look at the Bible as pornography, when the Bible speaks about God's wrath upon nations, I believe that my daughters would be more threatened and feel vomiting reading in the Quran that a Muslim man can take a slave girl, make her a prostitute, and know while he does it that God will forgive him. God will not forgive until he repents. The next question will go to Mr. Didat and will I please be able to remind you that as chairman and chair lady we have been given the authority to give the word to one person at a time and uh, again I'm sorry that I have to remind you about the time limit but we have to respect this that one person at a time speaks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Didat, yesterday you said it was different between numbers and uh, uh, Jesus said that me and the Father, we are one, is the first I will say. And uh, today you said that you respect Jesus, you love Jesus and you believe what he said. And uh, I want 
please, Mr. Stanley, if you can read one word from the Bible. I think it's Johannes 16. Ingen kan komma till fadern utom genom mig. No one can come to the Father except through me. This is what Jesus said. Yes, I wanted you wanted to know what Jesus had said, and I will tell you that. Your question, please. Uh, I will repeat what I understood that uh, with regards to the divinity of Christ that Jesus is God I was asking the pastor to give me an unequivocal unambiguous statement by Jesus that I am God worship me and thank God he didn't succeed but now the lady very fairly she's asking a question if I understood it correctly that Jesus did say I and my father are one that was the first statement. Was it? Where's the lady? She's, I and my father are one. Now, it implies that if he is one with God, then he is God. That is what it sees, seen on the face of it. I says, you know, sister or pastor, this quotation is in John chapter 10, verse 30. 10, 30. Where Jesus says, I and my father are one. He said that. I'm asking what is the context and believe me I have asked DDs and priests and reverends and pastors and predicants I'm asking what is the context meaning in what sense did he say that and in the past 40 years I haven't come across a single learned Christian who without opening the book can give me the context he has not been able to give yet what is the context? So if you see it in the context, it's not what you're thinking. In the context, we must see verses, not take them out from the context and say, look, the man said this. In what sense did he say? What was he trying to explain? So in the context, as it started, with John 23, 10, 23. And you read there, it says, and Jesus walked in Solomon's porch, meaning in the temple of Jerusalem. Then came the Jews round about him, meaning they surrounded him, and said, brandishing a finger in his face, How long does thou make us to doubt? If, thee, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Insinuating, alleging that he's talking ambiguously. If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. So Jesus says, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Neither, verse, that was verse 28, verse 29, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I and my father are one. This is the context. In other words, if once a person accepts faith, God sees to it that the person remains in faith, and I as a teacher, as a master, as a, uh, uh, I see to it that the person remains in faith, we are one in this, to see that the person remains in faith. Not in his omnipotence, not in his omniscience, not in his what? Knowledge, nothing. He's talking about the oneness of purpose in seeing that the believer remains in faith but the Jews were looking for trouble and when you are looking for trouble you find it around the corner you don't have to go very far so the Jews verse 31 the Jews picked up stones again to stone him so Jesus says many good works have I showed you from my father for which of those works do you stone me so they say, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, kufar. Because that thou being a man, makest thyself a god. That is the charge. That you are now claiming divinity. For that you deserve death, according to the law of the Jews. What does Jesus say to that? If he was God, he has an opportunity to say, look, if I am God, what else can I say? You ask me, are you Muslim? I, I said, look, I am a Muslim. I have to say, I am a Muslim. I don't know what you're going to do with that now. What do you want to do to me? But you say, are you a Muslim? I say, I'm a Muslim. If Jesus is God, then he should say, if I am God, what else can I say? But he didn't say anything like that. He said, is it not written in your law? He's sarcastic. 
The law means the Torah, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods. In other words, he's quoting from the 82nd Psalm, the pastor has already made reference to it. From the 82nd Psalm, he said, I said, ye are gods. It's a quotation. If he, God Almighty, called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, means the prophets are called gods in our scripture. This is our language. This is how we talk. Like in a court of law, in an English court, they say, me lord, me lord, who? The magistrate, the judge. He say, me lord, me lord, my lord, my lord, is he your lord, is he your god? Yeah. No, no, this is your language. You talk like that out of the sec. Me lord, me lord, means my lord, my lord. You don't mean God. That's your language. In South Africa, the word for God is here, hot, and here, the Lord, here, ek, ek is the here, I, I am God. And you go to Cape Town or any other place in the cities and you find there, it says there, signs, when you go to the toilets, it says Dharma, here. Dharma means days, ladies, and here means men, gentlemen. But at one stage I didn't know that here means gentlemen. I had learned it from the Bible that here means God, Lord. So I'm seeing Dharma, I guess it must be dames, ladies. But here... <laughs> toilet for gods in South Africa, toilet for gods. No, there are no toilets for gods. Gods don't go to toilets. But this is the language. So Jesus is telling, look, in our language, people are called gods, and you find no fault with that. Why are you finding fault with me when I say, I'm the son of God, which is a lesser expression than calling a person a god. Moses is called a god. The devil is called a god in the Bible. And the Jews are called gods, that ye are the ch children of God and the children of the Most High. Ye are gods and the children of the Most High, 82nd Psalm. So in other words, this is our language, we talk like that. The godly person, we say he's a god. He doesn't mean god, he's a godly. God, instead of saying godly, he says god. This is our language, why are you trying to find fault with me? No, there is no, no idea there but conveyed by Jesus when he said, I am my father one, meaning he is god. Thank you, sir. Then about that other verse, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man come unto the father but by me. That was the second one. Yes. Ah, it says, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He says, I accept that. You see, Jesus Christ, what you, when you read that, I think it's John chapter 14, start from verse chapter 13 and you read there, and each and every expression the Jews misunderstood. Everything the disciples misunderstood. Jesus is telling them that I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house there are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. And whither I go, ye know. You know where I'm going and the way ye know. They say, Lord, we know not whither thou goest and how can we know the way? They misunderstood. They misunderstood. Jesus is talking about God and about spiritual matters and they think of geographical locations. What? Stockholm, Oslo. <laughs> What's that? He's thinking about geographical places. He's talking about spiritual matters. So they said, look, we don't know and how do we know the way? Misunderstood. So he said, look, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It was too heavy for them. That was too heavy for them. So they say, again, Philip butts in, he said, look, all this what you are talking is too heavy for us. We don't know what you're talking about. You're talking over our heads. Just show us the Father and it suffices at us. Show us God. That will give us satisfaction enough. So Jesus says, Philip, you have been with me for so long. Why ask us thou show us the Father? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And they misunderstood again. It's a continuous series of misconceptions. So Jesus is telling them, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, how many times? 
And he explains to them, as I'm explaining to you now, like to little children, and they can't understand. So he said, are you even yet without understanding? And when he spoke further, he said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, telling his disciples, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I'm saying that if he was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed the honorable harakiri, suicide. Please. Next question goes to Mr. Stanley Schoberg, and now we will only allow two more questions. So please be as short and precise as possible. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Pastor, I think you have been treated as a liar by uh, not good Muslims and not good Christians. It was wrong. It was wrong, I said. Yeah. What's about you when you treated Sheikh as Hitler? You are not better. You should know it. I, I, will, be, I will be very quick. So, I said we are equal, and you should be better because you are a pastor. My question is, can I? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, many, have, uh, many Christians have met Jesus. They have met Jesus the Christ. So, I don't know if you have met him yourself before. So, my question is, as you said, Jesus is God, and God is Jesus. They are the same. So, when can we read in the last Bible, we suppose we will get the last Bible. That people have met God. That was my question. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Silence, please. Thank you. You see, your question is, if I have met Jesus, and if I have experienced him as God, and that is true. I have experienced that as I've been praying and I've experienced his presence. And I must clarify at the end of this conference that when Jesus said that uh, you are all gods, ironically he said that to the, to the crowd and those who not only know the Greek language in which the Bible was written here and the word God was used, but those who know the history knows that the word God had become so misused. If you go to a dictionary and read the history about this word Jesus is using here, as you quoted, even police officers called themselves gods during that time. So when Jesus came, he had to tell the people in a, on a higher level about his divinity. He could not because the word had become so misused and there was such an inflation of the character of the word so Jesus had to present himself and explain his divinity with other words that Didat does not accept and in deeds and in character and then he allowed the Holy Spirit to give confirmation and witness that Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit, Parakletos, a part of the Trinity of God gave witness and gave glory to Jesus. And in the Bible it says that God hath put all things under his feet. Now if God says about his son, 
that I have put all things that belong to me as the creator of this world, I have, an, I have given under your feet because we are one in a unique wholeness. Then the Bible clearly says that Jesus is God. And now there is only a final test that you can make. And that is, does the Quran and Islam bring you close to the heart of God? Does Islam create peace between people? Why not try Jesus and ask Jesus to show you what he wants to do for you? You will understand he has the answer he has got. Our final question, ladies and gentlemen, will go to Mr. Ahmed Idat, and afterwards we will conclude the session. Istas de dat, leš kurši mislimer i džihone Sweden, ma bistana po Saudita Arabien, po Sirien, leš kurši i džihone, leš Sweden fi masari fi hbas. Please, miss, you have to ask your question in English. Yeah, no, Sweden. For Arab, you must vet. Let's go to the Jikone. Let's. Sorry, miss. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Please keep the silence. Respect that this is the last question. Thank you for your patience. Sorry, miss. If you want to ask your question in another language, if you could get somebody to translate you, thank you. Sure. Is that your question, Miss? Is that your question? Silence, please. Thank you. We will not allow the answer unless there is peace in this room. Take another question. Can we have somebody to come and present this question for this lady? Thank you. Please silence from all the rest. The next person to come forward to ask the question. The baby said, why the Muslims are coming into Sweden? Excuse me. It's not a question according to the subject. We will see. We will see. Ask the next person to come forward. This is, we have to remind that this is not a political meeting. We will have to respect the question of the lady, but we cannot accept it as it is not belonging to the subject. We will ask for next person who has a question to Mr. Ahmed Idat to come forward. Thank you. Please remain silent. I ask you kindly. Please, next question for Mr. Didat. And everybody, please pay attention. We have but a few minutes to go. I appeal to you, sisters and brothers, to please keep calm for the next few minutes. Thank you. Next question for Mr. Didat, please. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir, thank you. Please. Please. Sisters and brothers, please, we are matured people. We are sitting here in the church hall. It is a hall of worship, the house of God. 
I appeal to you to please keep calm and please reflect this calmness in your outward disposition. Next question, please, for Mr. Didat. Uh, I'm sorry, my English is not so good, but I hope you understand me. You said, I'm sorry, you said that uh, our God, he, he goes to the toilet, he eats, he sleeps, he does as well, so and so and so. Okay, what about your God? What, what do you know? I don't know anything about the God. Maybe he does that. And what about your God? It does that or not? Do you know? Have, have you been in heaven before? Tell me that. And one other question, please. You said, listen, silence, you said God. Please, silence, please. You said, you said, please, please. You said, yeah. my goodness, you said, the question, you please. said God, you. do that for the Christian God, go toilet, go do, do that. Okay, what about God if he made mistake? It made me sick or not? Because the Shia said that the Prophet must be for Ali, and the Sena said the Prophet is Muhammad, and so God made a mistake too. We, thank you, uh, sister. Can you understand? You are, if you understood, I would have understood. I don't know. I haven't understood a thing. Okay. Please. I think. Here comes the translation. As far as I understand the question, she said, "Can God make a mistake?" Is that what it is? No, the answer is God does not make mistakes. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, both the speakers have presented their arguments to you. The decision is therefore yours to decide as to where lies the truth. You, brothers and sisters, be the judge. It is a matter between you and your Creator. Videotape of this meeting and the one held last night will be available. There is a stall in the foyer outside. On the stall is a box. If you wish to acquire a tape on a cost-to-cost -cost basis, Please leave your name and address, and you will be contacted. Thank you, sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here, for your support, and making this meeting a great success. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be with you. Thak sumayke wa akhiru dawani an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I also want to thank everyone for coming here tonight. I want to remind that the cafe on three floors is open for those who wish to discuss further.